you all very much for coming. As I said, this is going to be a bit of a talk about uh, protein language models. So, in general, I'll be going over some of the analogies between proteins and natural languages, a bit about what language models are and why we care about transfer learning, and what we did in our protein birth work. So, in general, we can view texts and proteins as being highly analogous. In both cases, we have sequences. We want to classify various properties about them or compare them, whether it's in the whole sequence or at per position, whether it's words or whether it's secondary structure. It doesn't really matter in terms of the approaches used to a degree. Where does it does matter? For example, we know what a language is. We can split it up into tokens, the fundamental unit which it's made out of. Could be words, could be letters. In proteins, is it an amino acid? Is it a secondary structure? Is it a motif? We don't know what they are and we can't separate them perfectly. We can still do uh, dumb approaches. The bag of words, for example, works fantastically for a lot of tasks in uh, NLP and in uh, protein analysis. And we can also transfer various methods over, TFIDF, uh, K-gram, k, -gram, k -mers, shingles, and so on. Uh, we did a lot of this in uh, Prophet and Neuropid. And these are the you know, simpler classical approaches. But the important thing is that proteins are not the same as natural languages. We can speak natural languages, but we can't speak protein. There are many differences, statistical, semantical, you name it. And end of the day, proteins are large mechanical machines made out of huge strings, while language doesn't exist. It's a made up uh, construct. Anyone interested? We did a nice review about this uh, recently and a bunch of methods. So language models. This is a bit more from the field of NLP, natural language processing. The general idea is that you have a statistical machine learning model which tries to predict the missing word. So a good one would say the cat sat on the mat, the dog sat on the mat. Cthulhu sat on the mat is slightly less likely, but it's still much more likely than the running sat on the mat or more reality on Cthulhu sat. This is completely dominated these days by giant neural uh, language models, deep learning, like a few other fields. And we care about this because predicting the missing word requires understanding many statistical features about a domain. In a natural language, it means syntax, context, common sense, understanding how things fit together. So the model needs to learn a lot implicitly in order to do this task. It needs to get very good statistical priors. And the fun fact is that we can do this in an unsupervised fashion. We don't need annotated data, and the evaluation is very fast. I don't need to start running a sequence through Rosetta and doing 3D modeling to tell it me if you know, is this a K in the middle of that sequence? This is also called, by the way, a buzzword of self-supervised learning. So why do we as uh, biologists or neuroscientists or whatnot care? So the hope is that we can get an ImageNet moment. This is the what happened in computer vision, where basically people realize that if you trained a deep model on the ImageNet data set of about 1 million images, 1,000 classes, you get much better performance on almost any other task much faster. Just take that big giant model and apply it to your domain of interest. And this works very well, especially when you have small amounts of data. For example, uh, here we see a huge difference. This is uh, some examples from NLP, but we see there's a huge amount of uh, difference in the performance if you only have, say, 100 samples. If you have 200,000 samples, there's still a notable uh, difference. I won't go into this too much beyond noting that the bigger, the better in this uh, field. Like the models can get gargantuan. Like uh, Facebook has one with they did the models of the going into the billions of samples and the billions of parameters, and it still didn't uh, asymptote. It just keeps getting better the more uh, money you uh, burn, the more rainforests uh, go into per uh, compute. And again, very popular field. So, what do we do? This was, was that. Uh, Oops, ah, no. Everything okay here? Yeah. Right. Sorry, I was afraid that something wasn't a thing. So the idea is that, again, to do a language model for proteins. And while we were working on this, a bunch of other papers came out roughly at the same time. So we weren't the only ones with the bright idea, unfortunately for us. And in general, though, pretty much everyone had a similar recipe. Basically, take an existing NLP architecture, usually from the same place train it on a data set of proteins, usually the biggest one they could find. In many cases, uh, redundancy is a separate question, and evaluate on some benchmarks. All well and good. This is just a tiny, tiny list. There's been a bunch like, coming out. So what do we do differently? 
Well, the big thing is that we have a very novel pre-training task, which is specific to proteins. We predict the gene ontology annotations for the different proteins that we have. Our architecture is also extremely different from uh, classical BERT uh, attention transformers. We have a novel form of attention, a uh, type of global attention, which has linear complexity instead of quadratic n squared complexity, which is a major bottleneck in these architectures. It's also highly interpretable. Our model is tiny compared to the average in the field. It's 16 million parameters and six layers with far faster computers, opposed to around 650 million parameters for a comparable model. And we also use convolutions, which is not used in classical architectures. We are very flexible to different sequence lengths. We can work with sequences which have uh, thousands of domain masses long. And we also support global and sequence level inputs and outputs. Our pre-training is also different than those few other technical details. And we show very strong results on a number of benchmarks, despite being a fraction of the size of comparable stuff. So, uh, and again, if you other technical details, this is how a layer looks in the model. I won't go into, we don't have enough time for it here. I'll just note that some of the other things we did in addition to the alternative attention is the fact that we don't use positional embeddings and we don't use dropout regularization. And we have a denoising task instead of classical mass language modeling for people who are a bit more familiar with the field. And again, very flexible to long sequence length and very small, very fast. Our data set was all of UNIREF 90 from just before the last CAFA competition and over 100 million proteins, billions of amino acids and about 9,000 uh, gene ontology mutations. We kept any which had more than 50 uh, occurrences out of all of the UNIREF sequences. This included biological functions, cellular functions, you know, stuff like cell location, molecular functions, you know, uh, what is the protein's property, so on. Uh, we also removed any sequences similar to the test set. And by the way, out of this 100 million, only 43 million had any go annotation. And out of those on average, they had about two out of, you know, 9,000. So multi level task, very noisy, very, very, very sparse. It was a big question as to whether this would actually improve things. In about three and a half weeks on this very small home GPU, like my GPU, we had enough time to crunch through 670 million sequences. This is massively faster than comparable uh, works with classical transformers. It's about one or two orders of magnitude faster for training and inf inference. Uh, we show how, by the way, again, the model keeps getting better the more time you train it for. We show how it does better with longer sequences. We also show strong results in a number of benchmarks with a big benefit from pre-training. Though again, the overall set of the model does better even without pre-training. Uh, again, say a superior model, say was lab uh, protein T5, which is 3 billion parameters as opposed to our 16 million. So a bit of a, a bit of a size difference. Hi, Dan. I'm sorry, if you could start to wrap up. Yeah, yeah I know that I'm at the last, uh, I should have a minute and a half. Huh? Um, so yeah, last, uh, we're near the end. So we show improved performance on a number of downstream tasks. We also show that some tasks do not saturate and some do saturate. We also show how we can analyze the global attention values and how they change given fine tuning on different tasks and do some ablation testing on the novel Go task and show that it greatly benefits a number of different problems. Yeah, we get better results and faster. So general takeaway I would say is that pre-training and self-supervised learning works and proteins can benefit from the approaches in NLP, but they're not the same as natural language and we should take advantage of this. There's enough stuff with proteins to, you know, if it's worth the effort. And you can also get a very, very strong model, even if you don't have thousands of GPUs in the supercomputer, even if some very modest hardware, like one small GPU is like trivial compared to, you know, just running uh, MSAs. So, and also these approaches are very useful for small data tasks and uh, our supervised adaptations include a lot of stuff. We released our models and also the, all of the data, including all of the monstrous data managing code we applied to get for Uniplot. Yeah, the stuff is in Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Flax, and Jax. We've been used by a number of other groups. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, questions? Hopefully, you have